In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play in the traditional territories, territories of Treaty 6, the gathering place of the Cree, Sotu, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, Nakota Sioux, located north of the Red Deer River. We also live in the traditional grounds of Treaty 7, the gathering place of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, Ainai, Gani, as well as the Iyei, Nakota, and Tutsina nations, the Métis, and all the people who make their homes south of the Red Deer. We are really happy to have her here today because we tried to book her three years ago when we had the Anne Frank A History for Today exhibit, and then COVID got in the way, so it had to be cancelled. And uh, then we tried to book her again, as some of you may know, in January for Holocaust Remembrance, and then some personal um, incidences came up in her world. So we're happy to have her on a lovely day for her to drive down or up to from Calgary. And she has been uh, working in the Museum and Heritage field for over 40 years. She has an MA in Canadian History and Master of Museum Studies from the University of Toronto. She's been the Executive Director of the Ontario Historical Society in Toronto, the Curator of Social History at the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton, the Senior Curator of Cultural History at the Glenville Museum in Calgary, and the Interim Executive Director at the Lawhee House Museum. She's also been a project manager at the National Museum of Science and Technology in Ottawa and the curator of the exhibition, A Coat of Many Colors, Two Centuries of Jewish Life in Canada. It was a joint project with the Canadian Museum of Civilization and the Canadian Friends of Beth at Futsal in Israel. <coughs> she has been a museum and heritage consultant for the past 19 years, uh, from anything from planning project management, curation, collections management, and uh, she worked doing those things from Canadian Museum of History, Lawhee House, Glenmore Museum, the Little Synagogue on the Prairies at Heritage Park, Calgary Board of Education, uh, the Len, um, Eleanor at Luxton Historical Foundation in Banff, the Museum of Tolerance in Jerusalem, and the Military Museums. In, 19, or in 2017, she curated the traveling exhibition, The Canadian Jewish Experience. She has also been an instructor in the Heritage Resources Management Program at Athabasca University for the past 11 years, where she wrote curriculum for the courses in museum interpretation and revised curriculum for the introduction of heritage resource management. So as you can see, it's a very long uh, career in the museum and heritage world. So we're really excited to have her here. So I will welcome you. Sure, I have this at the right height. Can you hear me through this? Oh. Or it's not on, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, is that better? Yeah, all right, good. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and introduction about myself, about the topic before we move into it. Um, so, this is actually a photograph of my great grandparents. Uh, their names were Sima and Mayer Smutkowitz, and they never came to Alberta, but they, <clears throat> they lived in Poland. And um, I, I wanted to give you a background uh, about myself, so you see my own background. Um, I'm a fourth generation Jewish Albertan, and it's my own personal story is not that unusual or dissimilar to many people in the Jewish community in Alberta. So my, my great-grandparents lived in an area called Celts. That was the name of the province. They lived in um, shtetls, which were little tiny villages in, in Eastern Europe that were populated not only by Jewish people, but Jewish people among others. <clears throat> my great-grandmother, I was named after her in the Ashkenazic Jewish tradition, which is um, the Jews from Eastern European countries. Um, it's our tradition to name babies after a deceased relative. So I'm actually named after her. My Jewish name is Sima. <clears throat> and so in the Jewish tradition, you'd, you would never have like John Jr. or that kind of thing because you're never named after a living relative. Um, so, so Sima died in Poland in 1930, but Mayer, my great-grandfather, perished in the Holocaust. He was taken out of his home and shot by the Nazis or Nazi collaborators. My, my great-great-uncle, that's uh, Mayer's brother, immigrated to a homestead near Leduc 
at the turn of the 20th century. He never married, he never had children, but he sent a ticket for my grandfather's eldest brother to come. He chose not to come because he thought Canada was what he called a trefina medina, which means a non-kosher land, which meant he thought it wouldn't be religious enough. He wouldn't be able to follow his religious practices here. And so instead, a younger brother, my great uncle Louis came, and then, and that was in the 19 teens, and then later, after World War I, he sent for my grandfather. And my grandfather, Joseph, came in 1923. He worked for a couple years, saved money, and then sent for his wife and four children. My father was among them. So, and my father immigrated to Edmonton in 1925. So mine is a common Jewish immigration story. A background in Eastern Europe, the, the Pale of Settlement, which is the region of Eastern Europe where um, the Jews live for the most part. I should also mention um, Jews who come from an Ashkenazi tradition like myself have a, usually an Eastern European or, or sometimes Central European background. But there are also Sephardic Jews and they come from Morocco, Spain, you probably have heard of the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in the 1490s and that, so, and those were Sephardic Jews. And um, the, some of their rituals and traditions differ from the Ashkenazic ones, but it's the same religion and the Jewish people are known as one people. So unlike, say, indigenous peoples or other groups, the Jewish people, even though we can be black, brown, white, and so on, we're one people. First wave of immigration to, of, of Jewish people to Alberta, 1889 to 1920. Oh, the other thing I should mention, many of you probably are aware of this, but just in case, um, being Jewish is a religion, but it's also a culture and an ethnicity. So, for example, if someone is Polish and Catholic, that would be the equivalent of being Jewish. In other words, it's a religion, but it's also an ethnicity. So you can be Jewish and still be an atheist, be an agnostic, not believe in God, not, not follow any religious customs, but still identify as Jewish. So, so it's a little different than most other groups in that regard. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay. Um, so why did the Jews leave Europe to come to Canada? Um, the major reason at this time, from the 1880s to, nine, to the time of World War I anyway, was pogroms. Pogroms were outbreaks in Russia and Poland and um, Galicia, countries of, in that area, in that region, in the Pale of Settlement, where um, uh, particularly um, during uprisings with the Tsar in Russia, where, where Jews became the scapegoat and were targeted, and, um, and Cossacks would come to the shtetls, the villages that I mentioned, or, or even to Jewish communities in major cities, and they would pillage their homes, they would loot them, they would often rape the women. They, it, was, it was really um, terrible carnage. And so, so many escaped, or if they were able to, because of this persecution. Also, they were conscripted, conscripted into the military, and it was another reason to leave, and they were conscripted at a very young age, and also for economic opportunities. Uh, and also their freedom to own land. Jews were prohibited from owning their own land in the Pale of Settlement, and also to live in a democratic country. And this was uh, from the Kishin of Pogrom, 1903. So immigration to Canada provided opportunities to own land and till the soil. Sir Alexander Galt, who's I've got my uh, yardstick here, <laughs> over here. He was Canada's High Commissioner to London in 1882, sort of like being the ambassador and he was looking to help the Canadian government populate the Canadian West. A transcontinental railroad was being built 
treaties with Indigenous peoples were being made and the land was being made available to settlers. They wanted to settle the West quickly because they feared U.S. expansionism north of the border. Gold had attended a meeting at Mansion House in London, the residence of the Lord Mayor of London, to decree uh, to do the barbaric treatment of the Jews of Russia following horrific pogroms and the implementation of drastic anti-Semitic measures. The meeting formed a committee to raise funds to transport Russian Jews to North America to become farmers. These Jewish settlers took advantage of the Canadian homesteading scheme that offered 160 acres of farmland to anyone for $10. If, after three years, they had built a house, seeded 25 acres and plowed 30 acres, they would receive clear title to the land and be offered an additional 100 acres. There were some 31 Jewish farming settlements on the, in the Prairie Provinces that sprang up between 1884 and 1912. In, 1903, sorry, in 1893, Alberta's first Jewish farming settlements began near Fort McLeod and also right near here at Pine Lake. The Calgary Herald, in a July 1893 editorial, evoked the traditional point of view that Jews were unfit to till the soil and I quote from the newspaper, if these people are the only settlers that can be obtained for the Northwest, there would even then be no reason to spend money in bringing them here, to let them loose on the public, while practical men who can turn the prairies into fruitful fields are being forced away by the petty annoyances to which they are subjected on attempting to come into the country. So even then, even escaping the pogroms, they, they experience discrimination here as well. In its time, the Pine Lake Settlement had the largest concentration of Jews in what is today Alberta, with a total of 70 in its heyday. These settlers experienced harsh pioneer conditions, compounded by the complete absence of Jewish community institutions in the area. The settlement failed by 1895, and most of the settlers relocated elsewhere. Um, Jewish farming began in southern Alberta after the turn of the 20th century with the establishment of block settlements. And by block settlements, I mean um, they weren't colonies like Hutterite or Dukabor colonies. They were private land, but they settled in a block, so near each other, but with, with non-Jewish neighbors as well in the block. Um, so a block settlement at Troshu in 1905, Ramsey, which is right near Troshu, in 1906, and Sybold in 1911. Ramsey Troshu was the largest with 89 families and 238 people with land holdings of 19,520 acres. These colonies had mixed grain, vegetable and livestock farms. These Jewish settlements were characterized by private land ownership, as I mentioned. With help from the Jewish Colonization Association, an international organization established in 1882 and led by French Jewish philanthropist, over here, Baron de Hirsch, uh, in cooperation with the Jewish Agricultural and Industrial Aid Society of New York, Jewish homesteaders could locate in areas where they were, there were already other Jewish settlers, as, as I mentioned. And there actually was a colony in Saskatchewan called Hirsch, named after the Baron. There we go. Um, okay. The colony of Sybold near the Saskatchewan border and the town of Alsace was known as the Montefiore colony, named after Sir Moses Montefiore a Jewish-British philanthropist who fought against the oppression of Jews worldwide during the pogroms in the 19th century. Some of you may be familiar with the little synagogue from the Montefiore settlement, the, the yellow building you can see here, now known as the little synagogue on the prairie at Heritage Park in Calgary. It had, um, so the, uh, the colony um, basically ceased to exist in 1927, and uh, it had, after that time, the synagogue had been used to store grain and then was moved to the town of Hannah in 1937 where it became a private family residence. 
It was later purchased by the Little Synagogue on the Prairie Society project and moved to Heritage Park, where it was restored to its original appearance as a synagogue. It is now actually the most popular site at Heritage Park. Oh, just a sec. Just want to go back one if I can. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I think I, I sent it. I sent you the wrong version. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, it's okay. I'll just leave it. Yeah. Uh, the first Jews known to have come to Alberta were traders and merchants who came north from Montana Territory. One of the first to be recorded was a gold prospector named Mr. Silverman, reported on in the Fort Edmonton Journal in 1869. The next known visitor was a man named Moses Solomon, who owned a saloon in Fort Benton, Montana. In 1873, he built a trading post on the Belly River, near present-day Fort McLeod. There were a handful of others during the 1870s, but none settled here permanently. In 1882, there were about 150 Russian Jews who joined the CPR construction crews that built the railway as far west as Medicine Hat, and, if, and a few Jewish laborers were among the crew members. While Jews in Alberta today are primarily located in Edmonton and Calgary, this was not always the case. The Jewish presence in Alberta predates the establishment of the province by two decades and once included farmers, ranchers, and traders, as well as business and community leaders in villages, towns, and cities across the province. There are several Jewish place names in Alberta. Most notably, the Frank Slide and Town of Frank was named after Henry Frank, who together with Samuel Gibo owned the Canadian American Coal and Coke Company, which operated the mine that the town was created to support. Henry Frank was also mayor of the town of Frank. Uh, Nordig, Alberta, um, was named after the town's founder, Martin Nordig, a Jewish German pioneer, entrepreneur, and former mayor of the town of Nordig. And uh, as, as I mentioned, fur and hide trading were among some of the common occupations of Jewish people in early days. There we go. Things were not, oh, sorry. Alberta's first permanent Jewish settlers were Jacob and Rachel Diamond, who arrived in Calgary in 1889 and remained for the rest of their lives. Jacob came to Canada in 1879, married Maria Studley, who converted to Judaism and changed her name to Rachel. Jacob's brothers, William and Philip, followed Jacob to Alberta. William settled in Edmonton and Philip eventually settled in Canmore. Each is considered to be a pioneer in his respective locale. Jacob started out as a peddler, but eventually became the proprietor of a successful liquor business when Prohibition ended in 1892. Two years later, the Diamond Brothers rented Calgary's Masonic Hall to convene services for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Jewish high holidays, which usually are in September. Things were not always easy, and these early Jewish pioneers experienced discrimination as well. An 1892 Calgary Tribune editorial stated, the cruel treatment experienced by these people in Russia has excited deepest sympathy, but it must be remembered that unbiased writers trace to their own unsocial, usurious, and crafty habits more than half the blame for the persecution against Russian Jews. They are a people apart. They make no alliances with Christians and have no dealings with them aside from trade transactions. Edmonton's first permanent Jewish resident was Abraham Crystal, who had come from Bessarabia to Edmonton in 1893, a year after it had been incorporated as a town. He became a successful businessman and helped bring other Jewish immigrants from his hometown in Bessarabia. By 1901, there were 17 Jewish citizens of Edmonton. In 1905, William Diamond, Jacob's brother, arrived in Edmonton. 
William, or Boss Diamond, as was his nickname, set up a clothing business in competition with Abe Crystal, but both worked together to lay the foundation for Edmonton's Jewish community. Together they formed the Edmonton Hebrew Association, which became the Beth Israel Synagogue, and hired Rabbi Hyman Goldstick, who you see on my immediate left, um, as he was from Latvia, and he served as the first um, rabbi for both Edmonton and Calgary. They soon established the first Jewish cemetery and Hever Kadisha, Jewish funeral home. In 1912, they built the first Beth Israel synagogue, an Orthodox synagogue in Edmonton. And soon thereafter, they opened the, the, the first Jewish day school, which was actually the first Jewish day school in Canada, the Edmonton Talmud Torah, that began in the basement of the synagogue. Rabbi Goldstick later settled long-term in Edmonton in 1912 and eventually moved to Edson, where he became the mayor. Okay. Some of you may have heard of his son, Cecil or Tiger Goldstick, an Edmonton legend, holder of the lightweight wrestling title, and he later became a well-known Edmonton sports broadcaster and philanthropist related to getting kids into sports. Goldstick Park in Edmonton is named in his honor. In Calgary, Bella Singer became well known for her efforts to bring other Jewish immigrants and her extended family out of the pogroms in Eastern Europe to settle safely in Calgary. Some of you may be familiar with her son, Jack, as a little boy, who became a prominent Calgary philanthropist after whom the Jack Singer Concert Hall was named. Another pioneer family in Calgary was the Shumiatchers, Judah Shumiatcher, the man with the long beard and the, the hat, was the family patriarch. He had a son, Morris. Morris changed the family name from Shumiatcher to Smith and became the founder and owner of Smith Built Hats, the makers of the famous white cowboy hat the official provider of the white cowboy hat given to all visiting dignitaries to Calgary. And uh, this slide shows uh, both the Calgary Stampeder <laughs> Football Club returning home to Calgary in 1948, all decked out in their white hats. And the other photo is the Crown Prince Akihito of Japan visiting Calgary in 1953, waving his white hat that he was given as a visiting dignitary. Um, in Calgary, the first synagogue was the Congregation House of Jacob, still, still around today. It's also an Orthodox synagogue. It's named both for the biblical Jacob as well as the, its congregation's founder, Jacob Diamond, the first Jewish settler in Calgary. It was founded in 1909. At left, at my uh, immediate left, is the, or the original building. And at right is the rendition by renowned Canadian artist William Kurilek, where he has depicted a Jewish wedding taking place in front of the synagogue. And this is the House of Jacob Synagogue as it looks today. It was built in 1983, and it's near, um, it's actually on Jerusalem Road, so near uh, 14th Street and 90th Avenue. And then I, I mentioned the Edmonton Talmud Torah, the, the Hebrew Day School, that was the first in Canada. And these are the three different buildings that it's had. So, this first one is initially, when it started in 1912, it convened in the basement of the synagogue. But in the 30s, they built this building. And then the middle building, the middle photo, that, that's the Talmud Torah that I attended in the 1960s. And then on the far left um, is the Talmud Torah today. 
And I should mention there's a very active alumni association and every 25 years they have a huge reunion celebration. And the 100th anniversary was in 2012 and I attended as an alumni in Edmonton and it was three days of festivities and they had um, all kinds of graduates over the different decades who are now uh, famous performers, rock stars, pianists, all sorts of things performing. They had several days of performances and they had uh, you know, all sorts of visiting dignitaries who were all alumni of the school o over time. So, so it was uh, really a phenomenal celebration and they had uh, they made a documentary and they, they published a book and you know, it, was, it was several days of celebration. Then the second wave of immigration, 1920 to 1939, um, during the 1920s people such as my own family came. There were still quite a lot of people who were able to come from Eastern Europe. But that trickled down so that by by the 1930s, almost no one was, was coming anymore. Um, there were uh, some Jewish war orphans who came in the 20s after the First World War. Oh, sorry. I'm out of... I'll just leave it for now. Okay, so many, many Jewish war orphans came and then also many Jewish war orphans came after the Second World War as well. In the 20s and 30s, many Jewish families were driven from their farms due to the drought, crop failures, low grain prices and enormous debts. Um, many towns at one time had a Jewish general store owner. Uh, at one time, there were Jewish people living in some 50 rural centers in Alberta. Jewish merchants operated general stores in Alliance, like this one, Bicycle, Big Valley, Czar, Daysland, Iracana, Morin, Munson, Olds, Turner Valley, Vegreville, Veteran, and many others. Other Jewish-owned businesses in small-town Alberta included car dealerships, clothiers, furniture stores, and jewelry shops. Hotels in such places as Drumheller, Gleeshan, Iracana, Okotoks, and Vegreville were once either Jewish owned or managed. There were also sizable Jewish communities at one time in Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, and they, they did have their own synagogues as well. Jewish immigration to Canada, as I mentioned, was very minimal in the 1930s, and just before the Holocaust and the start of the Second World War, as Hitler had risen to power and Jewish people in Germany and Austria were prohibited from working, owning property, attending schools, uh, and so on be before, before they were sent to ghettos and eventually the concentration camps, Canada was no friendlier to Jewish immigrants than other countries were. In fact, when Prime Minister Mackenzie King asked his federal immigration branch director, F.C. Blair, how many European Jews Canada should allow to immigrate, Blair's response was, none is too many, which is the title of the book on this topic by historians Irving Abella and Harold Troper. Jewish men enlisted in both world wars in the Canadian Armed Forces and uh, women too in the Second World War in disproportionate numbers as compared to the general population of Canada as a whole. During the Second World War, most Alberta families had come from Europe originally and most still had families there, similar to myself. So Jewish organizations raised funds for European relief and other war-related causes to assist the few Jews who were able to get through in the 30s and 40s. The Jewish community of Calgary formed the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society and the Polish Jewish Family Loan Association. By the end of the Second World War, over 200 Jewish men and women had enlisted in southern Alberta alone. Among them were the four sons of Strathmore dairy farmers, Sam and Henya Hansen. Albert, who won the Military Cross for Valor and was later wounded in a mine-clearing explosion. Jaime, an Army pharmacist. Morris, who joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. And Sam, a physician who treated injured soldiers on the battlefields in Belgium. Another enlistee was gunner Bob Satin, who signed up in September 1939 and saw action in Belgium, France, the Netherlands, and Germany. 
Following the war, he became a veterans advocate and founded the Jewish War Veterans of Canada, Calgary branch. And I should mention the military museums in Calgary has um, a, a sort of um, community display cases down one hall and the Jewish war veterans of southern Alberta, they have their own display case. And um, they were a very active association but they've now sadly all died out. Yeah, um, Jewish people were actively involved in um, civic boosterism. Uh, the, this photo, the baseball team is a, a Jewish baseball team from 1913 in Calgary. And, and to the far left is a Jewish cub pack in the Calgary Stampede Parade in 1924. This is a photo of Jewish war orphans coming after the Second World War. After the war, attitudes towards Jews changed with awareness of the Holocaust and with the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Overt anti-Semitism declined but did not disappear. Once again, Jewish war orphans who survived the concentration camps or lived in hiding during the Holocaust were now welcomed to Canada. Quite a number of them settled in Alberta and were adopted by Jewish families. Um, I did want to add, though, that there were certain forms of more overt discrimination that did persist. Country clubs still did not allow Jews to join uh, in, here in Alberta, as well as throughout Canada, um, at least until the 1960s. And there were also quotas at many universities uh, professional schools such as medicine or law on the number of Jewish students allowed admittance. In more recent decades, Jewish immigrants have come to Alberta from South Africa, Russia, Israel, and Argentina. Since 1945, the Jewish population of Edmonton has grown to, to today about 5,000 people and Calgary's to about 9 or 10,000. They have both grown in cultural diversity, confidence and prosperity. Urban Jews have contributed to the broader community in which they live in numerous ways. In politics, there have been several Jewish politicians, most notably Harry Viner, who was mayor of Medicine Hat almost continuously from 1952 to 1974, and Stephen Mandel, who was mayor of Edmonton from 2004 to 2013. In other ways, Jewish Albertans have contributed to the arts, culture, education, medicine, charitable work, and many other areas. The names of institutions such as the Martha Cohen Theatre and Jack Singer Concert Hall that I mentioned earlier, uh, Carl Safran Centre for Continuing Education in Calgary, and um, this is the, the Citadel Theatre and Joe Schachter Theatre, uh, Martha Cohen Theatre and Jack Singer Concert Hall, and then to my far left, um, the Lib and Cardiovascular Institute at the University of Calgary. There's also the Tevi Miller Heritage School Program in Edmonton for students with speech and language delays. All of these are a testament to the indelible stamp the Jewish community has made in Alberta. And that's the conclusion of my formal presentation, but um, I welcome any questions. Yes? When you were saying that the settlement started and then stopped, where did they go? Okay, so it, it depends, but there were um, quite a number, like say, the Montefiore colony, which I know the most about because I was involved with the development of the little synagogue at Heritage Park. So that colony, quite a number of the families moved to California. Some became chicken farmers in Petaluma, California, and others moved to Los Angeles, and they actually formed their own Montefiore club. The, the uh, 
Montefiore expats who moved to California. And then there was, uh, their children had a junior Montefiore club, the next generation. And when we opened the little synagogue at Heritage Park, um, 17 descendants came from Los Angeles to the opening and they donated the gavel from the Montefiore Club and the Junior Montefiore Club, both gavels they donated <laughs> to Heritage Park. So, so the, um, others moved to Edmonton and Calgary. Um, and in fact, it's, it's very unusual for um, Jewish graves to be interred and moved. Uh, but in the case of Montefiore, because the Jewish settlement completely ceased to exist, the Jewish community in Edmonton and the cemetery, the, the Jewish cemetery, they arranged in the 1930s or 40s, I believe, to move the graves from Montefiore to the Edmonton Jewish cemetery. But in general, uh, I would say like from Ramsey Troshu, there, there is, I think, Waterman, Sam Waterman, who was kind of the leader of the community, he, um, and Sengas was another one. One of, the, I think it's Sengas, their great-grandson still lives there, but no longer practices Judaism. But in, in most cases, people relocated either, either to Edmonton and Calgary or to, to small towns at that time in the 20s, 30s, uh, where they became general store owners or, or other kinds of business endeavors. But for the most part, have, are settled in Edmonton or Calgary today. Mm -hmm. Rod? Hi, Sandra. In, uh, in John Heller, there was some Jewish families. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder, diamonds, was Peter Diamond related to the diamonds of the I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, but I know uh, Harry Sanders, who you might be familiar with, who's a historian. He, he actually was born in Drumheller. His father, I think, ran the hotel. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he would know the answers because he would know everyone from the Jewish community there if you know him. Yeah. What's the other thing? So, Canyon Meadows, mm -hmm. the Jewish community built that because they couldn't golf with other golfers. Yeah. That, that, that kind of thing, I, I made reference to that. Yeah, that kind of phenomenon was the way it was. That's right. Yes. I noticed uh, in one of the early um, pictures, there was when they were recruiting in Europe, um, just had people come to Canada from the 1800s. Yeah. It specifically said Manitoba. Yeah, but it was all my through. understanding, yeah. I, I believe that the, uh, the Jewish community in Manitoba, or specifically Winnipeg, is quite large. Is that true relative to, say, Calgary and Edmonton? Um, it's larger than Calgary and Edmonton, but no longer that much larger than Calgary. Like, I think maybe 15,000 compared to nine or 10,000 in Calgary, but it was much larger traditionally. Like um, I grew up in Edmonton and Calgary. My, my mother was from Winnipeg. And um, the- Why is that that it's larger there? Is it something like those were signs? No, Winnipeg was the gateway to the West, you know, in, in the, at the turn of the last century. And I mean, it was a very booming uh, place, you know, at one time. I mean, now Edmonton and Calgary have way surpassed it as far as that goes. But, but uh, and population size much bigger in Alberta as well. But at that time, it, it, was, a, it was a booming, bustling city and it, it was the gateway to the West. And so... Um, a lot, a lot more people settled there. I mean, I know when, when I was a, when I was living there as a child, in the well, in the 60s, 70s, it was probably 25,000 the population, and it would have been much smaller here than it is now. You know, maybe half the size. So um, it declined, though. I, you know, there's an expression: Winnipeg is a good place to come from, which you may have heard. You know, <laughs> it's very, very cold in the winter and. Uh, lots of insects and humidity in the summer. So um, a lot of people and a lot of very talented people grow up there and leave, you know, not just in the Jewish community, but in, in general. Um, so that's one reason why it's declined. But the other thing, um, the Jewish community in Winnipeg actually, um, you know, there, there, were, there was a lot of political instability in Argentina, and they, they actually made a kind of an arrangement with the Jewish community in Argentina. People wanted to emigrate, and so they made it attractive for 
um, a large contingency, uh, contingency of Jewish people from Argentina to come and settle in Winnipeg. Um, this, despite the weather, many did go there. So there's actually quite a lot of Argentinian Jews living in Winnipeg since, since for sure, the, um, the 90s anyway, maybe even earlier. They're quite, quite sizable. And, there, and some have settled in Calgary too, but not not so many. Like and then did immigration continue up to um, Vancouver and British Columbia? They have a bunch. Yes. Well, lar larger than in Alberta, um, Winnipeg wa was l the largest for Western Canada, but n now I'd say Vancouver would probably well mm, comparable anyway. Yeah. Mm hmm. You mentioned that there was a Jewish community in Carmel. Mm -hmm. When did they disperse? Um, I think 1895. You you might know Michael Daw, who used to be the archivist here. He's done quite a lot of research on it, and he's published a couple of articles ab about the the uh, the settlement here. Um, I think you know they had they were very isolated. They they also had a lot of bad luck. The the man who, who was their leader and spiritual leader as well, the rabbi, was um, actually, I think, accidental. He his gun went off and he accidentally shot his horse, and you know there were a, like a variety of bad circumstances that all led to its demise at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, how many details to put into my presentation, but yeah. Is that camp still going out of the Yes, area? yes. There is a Jewish sleepover camp for children called Camp B'nai B'rith uh, at Pine Lake. And it's been around, I think, since the 50s. I attended it in 1966. <laughs> I know. At that time, they didn't have a swimming pool. I remember getting hives in the lake. Yeah, now they have a pool. Though. <laughs> it's the only Jewish sleepover camp in Alberta. One of the things I was going to mention, I didn't know Martin Nordic was Jewish, mm -hmm. and I've heard presentations on him. He was so ahead of his time, and I was just amazed by all that he did for that town, mm -hmm. and how he integrated all these different nationalities, and you know, has volumes of healthcare and things that nobody else had. It was really yes. an amazing story, and now, now that adds to it, I didn't know that. Story. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. really where that's very interesting. Anyone else? Okay. okay, well, thank you all for coming. If you want to chat more one-to-one, -one, I'll be around for a little while. <laughs>